I was searching on the internet for some information um, the other day, and I, I saw an article about some chemical company that had a manufacturing plant in Tennessee, Tate and Lyle, is the name of the company. I was talking about the production of an artificial sweetener called, or not artificial, of a low calorie sweetener called allulose. And I use artificial sweeteners in my coffee, you know, like those pink packets of saccharin or um, <clears throat> stevia, the stevia glycosides, or sometimes aspartame. I've never seen allulose, and so I didn't even know the structure of allulose, which is, and I've seen a lot of, or if I've, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of chemical structures, or if I've seen it, I, I, I couldn't recall the, the name or the structure. So I, I went on to the web and I saw that they sell big bags of allulose, to my surprise. And it says on here it's non-GMO, not genetically modified organisms. Keto certified, so what does that mean? No ketone groups, or certainly has to do with the ketogenic biosynthetic pathways or, or, or catabolic pathways. It says it has no carbohydrates, uh, no, no gluten proteins in there. That sounds pretty cool. Let's go ahead and take a look at this allulose, and where does that come from? <clears throat> it comes from corn. You know, in our country, we produce vastly, vastly more corn than any human could ever use. And so these large farming conglomerates are looking for ways to turn their corn that they overproduce into something valuable. And so you can take corn and convert it into cornstarch and send it to one of these plants, and they will convert that into allulose through a complex process. But the key step in that process, the step that really does something that may not be familiar to you, is they ultimately convert corn into fructose. You've, I'm sure you've had drinks before that contain high fructose corn syrup that comes from, uh, from corn, obviously. Uh, but that's what, where they, what they use as a starting material to synthesize allulose. And if you look at these two structures of fructose from corn and allulose, they look pretty similar. And the difference here really is this one hydroxyl group here. If you look at the, uh, at the Wikipedia description, it says allulose is a low calorie C3 epimer of the sugar fructose. And epimer means that it just differs by the position of a single proton. <clears throat> There's a configurational difference, uh, actually, uh, yeah, usually a, a single proton. So in this case, the proton that they don't draw, in, in the case of fructose, at this C3 position, right, you start numbering here, one, two, three, that's the way you would number this, this monosaccharide, this sugar uh, fructose. And when you look over here at allulose, that, 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 that H atom over here at the three position is sticking up. And there is no chemical transformation that we will teach you that, that tells you how to take an alcohol and invert the configuration cleanly like that. So what's going on here in this, in, in this reaction? <clears throat> well, what they do is they take these solutions of fructose that ultimately come uh, from, from corn, and they rely on the fact that fructose is a hemiacetal. Right? We've talked about hemiacetals before. When you have hydroxy groups five or six atoms away from, from ketone groups or aldehydes, they want to cyclize to make five or six membered rings. <clears throat> and so there is an equilibrium that you can't stop. There is an equilibrium between this open chain form and the closed hemiacetal form um, <clears throat> that favors the closed form. But there is a small amount of the open chain ketone form in there. No matter what you do, there will be a little bit of this ketone form at equilibrium. And somebody discovered an enzyme uh, called tagatose 3 epimerase that's not supposed to work on, on this substrate. But if you have high enough concentrations, this thing will land in the active site. The open chain form will land in the active site at, at that enzyme. And the enzyme has a manganese atom. It serves as a Lewis acid that coordinates to this, to this carbonyl, manganese. <clears throat> Two plus, all right there, is for the, for the charge. Um, <clears throat> and that makes it very easy now to deprotonate this proton here at the three position. That proton is at the alpha position of the carbonyl group. And so the enzyme positions a base down there uh, to pull that proton off. And in the same enzyme active site, there's an acidic functional group that sticks a proton right back 
uh, on that, that three position of this, what is now an enolate. And so your arrow pushing would look like this. It's just protonation of the enolate. Back and forth, this enzyme will, will epimerize this three position. And once you epimerize that three position, now you're back here at this other open chain form that's now epimerized. And when that cyclizes back, you get allo allulose. So this is the way they're producing um, allulose. Um, you know, I'm sure that they're using genetically modified corn in order to raise their, their crop yields. I'm sure that they're using genetically modified forms of, of amylase in order to break that down into the starch down into um, glucose and then other enzymes. Um, I feel like probably every single part of this process involves genetically modified, you know, recombinant uh, enzymes. Um, but once you crystallize allulose and it is pure, it doesn't matter where you got that from. It is not, this is not an organism. It is not a genetically modified organism. It's a pure chemical. Um, so they're perfectly free to say it's not GMO. Uh, is it really fair to say that this is not uh, a, a carbohydrate? Well, this is exactly a carbohydrate. These chemical structures are by definition carbohydrates. But the FDA has said because it is so low in calories, one-tenth the calories of table sugar, uh, they're allowed to claim that it is not a carbohydrate when scientifically, and in fact, it is exactly a carbohydrate. Um, and, okay, it's not keto, but wow, you know, that's the whole isomerization here is based on the fact there's a ketone. Just a lot of weird stuff in there. It was kind of humorous that I was looking here at the, for a good picture to put as my start, and I started to paste this picture in as our starting slide, when I noticed they've drawn the wrong structure here for allulose. They've, they've mistakenly put the hydroxy group here at this position where it doesn't belong. That hydroxy group is supposed to go over here in that hemiacetal. So that's not actually the three epimer. That's the wrong chemical structure. Um, kind of amusing. But it's cool to see you know, this pure chemical compound allulose uh, once you're done with a chemical process and you crystallize things, that's really the ultimate impurity uh, for, for organic chemists. Now, when we left off, we were taking a detour from enolate chemistry. You know, this chapter and the next chapter are about deprotonating next to carbonyls, <clears throat> deprotonating right here, making carbanions and using those as nucleophiles for SN2 reactions or for addition to carbonyl groups. Uh, but we're taking a detour right now showing you how to install a bromine leaving group at the alpha carbon. If the alpha carbon has a, an H on there, we can use this, this recipe, so for ketones, for aldehydes it's common, um, <clears throat> where you use bromine and acetic acid CH3CO2H is kind of like a text way to, to show acetic acid. That's the solvent for the reaction. And when you do that, you get the alpha bromo ketone or, or aldehyde. And that's great because now you have a potential leaving group for doing reactions like SN2 reactions. Right? You can treat this with sodium methoxide. Methoxide's not so great because it's a a strong base, but thiolate anions are nucleophilic and not strong bases. So you can displace that bromide, right? You, you, get, um, <clears throat> you, you get a mixture, you have to watch out that you're getting a racemic mixture. So if you're doing a multi-step synthesis on my exams, usually I don't ask you to, to uh, draw the stereochemistry or else I would design a problem where there is no stereochemistry. Um, <clears throat> but of course, you're, you can't control which face the bromine lands on. And if you take an alpha bromo compound, you can also displace those with amines. So if you throw in an amine like diethylamine, you can easily synthesize um, this nitrogen carbon bond. We're gonna talk about this more in chapter 23. This is really the stuff of chapter 23. We'll talk about this process right here. It's an SN2 reaction, you should know that. The problem with this SN2 reaction, as we'll get to in chapter 23, is that the product of the reaction is not the amine, it's the ammonium bromide salt. Now, organic chemists like neutral molecules that we can extract into organic solvents, right? And then you'll evaporate the solvent and it's purified away from the junk. Um, but if you want the neutral compound, what you have to do is you have to use an excess of the amine. And we'll show you a different trick when we get to, because if you add an excess of the amine, now the excess ethylamine will deprotonate this. 
And that's how you get your neutral amine. You're going to waste some of your uh, ethylamine using it as a, a base to deprotonate your, your, your product, but that's okay. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if you install bromine atoms as leaving groups at the alpha position of a carbonyl compound, uh, that's pretty useful. Now there's one, now you already knew SN2 reactions. You should have known how to do these types of transformations without me telling you. Uh, what you didn't know is this other secret transformation that I'm going to show you. So if you use these conditions here, these conditions where we, we install a bromine atom, and notice I've picked a substrate here that can only brominate on one side, because uh, we don't want to end up with a mixture here and, uh, of two different uh, regio isomers. So if you install a bromine atom here, yes, you could do SN2 to displace that bromine, but there's another transformation that does an elimination reaction efficiently. So what do you do to eliminate that so you don't get SN2 plus E2? Right? Nobody wants to get a mixture of SN2 and E2, and that's exactly what's going to happen if you're trying to eliminate with typical bases you know about. So there's this secret E2 eliminate. It's not exactly E2. We're not going to talk about the mechanism. There's a secret recipe for eliminating alpha bromo ketones. It is designed specifically to work for alpha chloro or alpha bromo ketones, actually only alpha bromo. And here's the recipe. You couldn't invent this. You simply have to memorize it. It involves taking lithium carbonate. <clears throat> carbonate anion. Let me just remind you. Here's what a carbonate anion looks like, dianion and then two lithium atoms on there, that's carbonate. So you take lithium carbonate, you take lithium bromide. There is no way for you to anticipate why, why that's in there, you just have to memorize this recipe. And then that's not enough. There's one and only one solvent that this works with, and you have to memorize this solvent. The solvent is NN dimethylformamide. Uh, I'm not going to make you memorize the structure of NN dimethylformamide, it's just a very polar solvent. Uh, second most polar solvent, uh, beyond uh, second to water. Well, actually, uh, maybe DMSO. Very polar solvents. When I see people using DMF, I'm thinking, man, they really wanted a polar solvent for that. And that's the recipe you need. And once you do that elimination, it's not a simple E2 elimination mechanism. Uh, you don't need to know the mechanism. Once you do that elimination, now you're ready to add nucleophiles to the beta position. Remember cuprates? Remember how we told you that cuprates can add to that, that beta carbon doing 1,4 addition reactions? So that's a valuable transformation <clears throat> to be able to, to take a ketone uh, like this one over here that has no, no way to functionalize that beta position and then make an enone that allows you to functionalize the beta position. And, and we're going to tell you even more reactions that are specific to the beta position of enones <clears throat> in the coming chapter. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Let's get back to the main theme of this chapter, which is making enolates and doing valuable stuff with those enolates. And what is our best recipe for making enolates? Our best and most reliable recipe for making enolates, now that it's, you know, 50 years ago it was a different situation, but nowadays, if I wanted to make an enolate of this carbon, notice on this side over here, you can't make an enolate on the oxygen. You can't deprotonate oxygen, the alpha atoms and oxygen. So there's only one side we can deprotonate on, um, and, and the, the base that we would use would be LDA, THF, minus 78 space degrees Celsius. Degrees Celsius, you know, those two characters are jammed together as one unit. So that's the recipe, and that recipe will make an enolate. Boy, so, so awesome to make an enolate. This carbanion, I'm going to draw the carbanion resonance structure of the enolate, but there's, you could also draw the resonance structure where it's a CC double bond. This will help you to see which carbon is nucleophilic. And now you can go to town with SN2 reactions. Let's watch and see how this works. If I wanted to make a new carbon-carbon bond, I just throw in some methyl iodide or some other alkylating agent, and there we go. We got a brand new carbon-carbon bond. Now we'd get a racemic mixture out of that, but uh, let's not worry about that right now. Um, <clears throat> okay, but always be on the lookout for creation of new stereogenic centers. Actually, it depends on R. If R is an H or a methyl, it's not stereogenic. Um, okay, so we want to make enolates. Boy, it is hard to, it's harder to deprotonate esters. So I showed you a table of pKa's, and I told you, oh, you've got you've to know the pKa's of esters versus amides versus ketones. Esters are 100,000 times less acidic than ketones, but LDA has no problem 
deprotonating this efficiently in 100% yield. Amides, that CH, is 100,000 times less acidic than a, an ester, way less acidic than a ketone. But you know what? LDA is so powerful and awesome, no problem deprotonating with LDA. LDA, I'm going to do two steps here with this arrow. THF, can't fit it all in here, minus 78 space degrees Celsius. And I'll enumerate these steps. First, I'm going to make the enolate. Now, we can't isolate these enolates. We don't isolate lithium enolate. It's kind of salt type things. We, we want neutral molecules to isolate. So that day or that hour, as soon as we're done making the enolate, as soon as you're done dripping in your carbonyl to the LDA solution, you have to be ready to use that. You can't be dilly-dallying around. So now we're ready to throw in an alkylating agent. You can see the transformation I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to make a new carbon-carbon bond with a three-piece uh, allyl group. So I want to draw that three-carbon allyl group, and let's put a leaving group there. The common one is, is allyl bromide. Um, you can buy allyl chloride. It's just not as efficient. You can buy allyl iodide. It's just big hassle and not worth the, the, the extra effort to have a tiny, a slightly better iodo leaving group on there. Allyl bromide is uh, one of the most common alkylating agents. I'm, you know, this is a super common transformation to add allyl groups uh, at the alpha position of carbonyls using uh, enolate chemistry. And you're going to, uh, what's going to happen it, it, on, when you work problems in the back of the chapter that involve allyl bromide as an alkylating agent is you're going to forget to draw this carbon right here. You're going to draw the double bond directly at, and you're saying, well, I'm not going to forget that. No. Yes, you will. So let me just tell you right now, don't forget that carbon. And if you see us alkylating with allyl bromide, you double check and triple check that you didn't forget to draw that CH2 group. The double bond is not directly attached to the allyl carbon. <clears throat> so when we make enolates and we do alkylation chemistry through SN2 reactions, there's really three best kinds of substrates to do SN2 reactions with. It doesn't matter whether you're using alkoxides or enolates, but now that we're getting serious about SN2 reactions by, by doing enolate chemistry, let's talk about the three types of halides that are commonly used for SN2 chemistry. So number one in our book for doing SN2 chemistry here is <clears throat> methyl iodide, right? What's the problem with SN2? It has competing E2 elimination. Once we teach you to use powerful, strong nucleophiles, they're also powerful bases. We don't want E2 elimination. And I promise you, methyl iodide will never undergo E2 elimination to make a double bond. There's not even a second carbon in there. There's no beta hydrogens. The only thing that can happen is SN2. You'll get 100% yield of SN2 if you use methyl iodide. Similarly, benzyl bromide. Notice how there's no protons here at this alpha position of benzyl, of, of benzyl bromide, of course you're not going to do an elimination if there's no such thing as, as a beta proton. You can't make a, a double bond between the yellow carbon and the benzylic carbon. So that's perfect. You get only SN2 with benzyl bromide. And it doesn't matter, you know, you could have other substituents here, and you're still going to get clean SN2. I mean, oftentimes we don't use, every lab has benzyl bromide, but you could have a bromine atom here or a nitro group here, right? Those, those things don't stop the SN2 reaction from occurring. So <clears throat> again, benzylic bromides. And you know how to make benzylic bromides. We taught you how to put bromine atoms at the benzylic position using radical reactions, Br2 and light. You know how to make substrates like that. The last kind of alkyl halide that's, that we like to use for SN2 reactions um, <clears throat> is, is allyl bromide. Now, you might argue and say, and I don't mean argue in a bad way, you might say, hey, there is a, a beta proton there. It just turns out it's very unfavorable to deprotonate, to lose HBr, to make this thing called an allene. Right? You, you, I'll draw the carbon atom in the middle there. Um, that's just very unfavorable. So you never see that happen. All you see is SN2 with allyl bromide. So these are our three, and again, it would still work even if we had, if we put other groups here, it's still an, an allyl bromide. Right, you, <clears throat> that's still a, an allylic bromide. So these are our favorite classes of substrates for doing SN2 reactions. And now that we're coming back and talking about enolates, we're ready to start thinking about SN2 reactions again as potentially useful. Boy, you're, 
your repertoire of synthetic transformations is really expanding now. The number, the, the types and number of organic molecules that you know how to synthesize using the tools that we've given you, if you practice them, is, is now quite vast. Let me just give you an example of how we think about enolate chemistry. When I look at molecules, <clears throat> when I look at molecules that look like this, you know, I'm thinking about all the reactions I could do. I, I could do a Wittig reaction and convert that to a CC double bond. Once I have a double bond, I can add HBr or do hydroboration. Here's another double bond I can do. I could do ozonolysis or add Br2 across that. Um, <clears throat> so we like to make bigger and bigger molecules. Um, and let's go ahead and talk about this, because as soon as I see a molecule that looks like this, I'm thinking, wow, I could have made all three of those carbon-carbon bonds there using enolate chemistry. And let's go ahead and show how you can use enolate chemistry iteratively, over and over, uh, <clears throat> to do organic synthesis. So if I have this ketone starting material, we call this acetophenone. You don't need to know the name of that. It's just very common. I can make an enolate out of that. What's our recipe for making an enol enolate? Step one, LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees Celsius. That's step one, that makes the enolate. And then we can alkylate that. So which bond should we make first? It actually doesn't matter here. We could make the bond to the methyl group. We could make the bond to the, the benzyl group. We could make the bond to the allyl group. So it doesn't matter the order. I'm just arbitrarily going to decide to add the methyl group, the CC bond to the methyl group first. So what's step two going to be? We're going to throw in something that can do an SN2 on methyl. Methyl iodide is the common one. I'll draw the bond. I don't know why I'm choosing to draw the bond there. Um, <clears throat> and that would put a methyl group on there. But the advantage of this is we still have two H's on that alpha carbon that we can make enolates with. I'll draw CH3 there just so we can see. Oh, that's not a well-drawn C. Um, I'll draw CH3 on here even though we don't normally draw. Just so it matches up with the product. There we go. It's that easy. And you might think, why? Boy, LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees Celsius. I'm never going to remember that. I promise you, if you've worked enough problems in the back of the chapter, you will remember LDA, THF, minus 78 space degrees Celsius. You can remember that. You have to remember that. Okay, we got two more groups to add. What should we add next? It doesn't really matter. We can add the owl or the benzyl. I'll add the benzyl group next there. And so what's our first step going to be? We've got to make the enolate. What are we going to use? We're going to use LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees Celsius. Step two, we need to make a bond to a benzyl group. <clears throat> And so, some, oftentimes we write out benzyl bromide like this. Let me just be clear, because some people, I, I, it's not clear, they think that this means benzene bromide. When, when you write benzyl bromide like this, the structure for that is this. This is a benzyl group right here that I'm going to draw. It's not phenyl bromide. You can't do SN2 reactions on phenyl bromide. This is benzyl bromide. Notice that there's a CH2 group on benzyl bromide right here. There's a CH2. And if you didn't have that CH2, you couldn't do SN2 reactions. So benzyl is not benzene bromide. It is a benzylic group with a CH2 group sticking off the chain. OK, when we do make the enolate, and we add this benzylic group here, PH is the abbreviation for phenyl, not, not BN. Now we've got one proton left on here. And now we can use LDA again. As long as we've got alpha protons there. Step one, LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees Celsius. Step two, now we're ready to add this allyl group on there. And we're going to use allyl bromide. <clears throat> Three carbons. Count them to make sure you didn't make a mistake. Allyl bromide. <clears throat> That's got uh, what a great substrate because there's no competing E2 elimination for these. So that's the way we think about enolate chemistry. And midway through, if you wanted, you, you could have been, I don't know, if, if you wanted, you could have brominated the, the benzene ring here using electrophilic aromatic substitution. You could have stopped here and started adding Grignard reagents into this carbonyl and then extend the chemical structure that way. 
I mean, the number of different transformations you've got, you could do hydroboration oxidation and add an OH group over here, and then make that into a leaving group and do some other stuff, or oxidize that with PCC to a car. The number of transformations you've got is quite massive. I mean, you can now make an endless array of potential cures to, to diabetes, uh, to, uh, to skin cancer, to, to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so it's great to have these very powerful transformations uh, that we can use. Now, LDA, before you, you get all excited about this, you gotta be really careful about LDA. It is a powerful base, and it is so powerful that it'll react with the water molecules in the air that you're breathing right now, right? If I, if I <sighs> come over and I, 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 I blow on some glass, it turns foggy because there's water vapor everywhere. So you have to avoid OH groups like in, like in the air we breathe. We take the air out of our chemical reactions when we do LDA reactions. We re replace it with dry nitrogen gas. That's quite expensive, but we're willing to pay the price. And you can't have o acidic H's in your solution when you use LDA. So you have to really focus on what are the acidic protons on any molecule. And you can't have uh, potentially acidic water, OH groups, or other types of acidic functional groups when you use LDA. So I expect you to know, if you've got a mixture of 50 molecules or one molecule, where is LDA going to deprotonate? So as soon as we see, and this is a challenge because we don't draw those H's for you. Over here on this uh, ester, there's really only one position to protonate. There's only one alpha carbon, right? The other side of this, this oxygen atom, that has, that's not an alpha carbon. You can't deprotonate. If it was an OH, you could deprotonate, but you can't deprotonate uh, um, any other part of this molecule. No other atom is acidic. This is the acidic um, position right there, is that alpha carbon. That's where LDA would deprotonate. Look at all these oxygens over here in this other molecule, right? I, I feel like people seem to think that electronegativity is important, like, oh, that's next to an oxygen that's electronegative, maybe I can deprotonate there. No, there is no base that can deprotonate next to an ether. Electronegativity is not what makes the alpha proton acidic, it's resonance that makes it acidic. There, where would LDA deprotonate? Now remember, You've got protons on both sides of, of this carbonyl, but LDA is choosy. That's why we have those bulky isopropyl groups on LDA. It is true that there are protons on, on this other side. I don't really want to draw this, but, right? but LDA is choosy. You only deprotonate here. That's the less hindered side. Let me just write it there. Less hindered. Right? There's one fewer alkyl groups on this right-handed alpha carbon. And so that's the side that you would deprotonate on with 100% selectivity with LDA. LDA doesn't make mistakes like that. <clears throat> you make an enolate only on the less hindered side. So the, the deal is that these two protons have about the same acidity. If you, if you could measure the pKa, or if you treat it with T-butoxide, the, the, the CHs on both sides are, have about the same acidity. So if you've got about the same acidity, then it's gonna be sterics that determines where LDA deprotonates. Like, and that's typical with ketones, where you can deprotonate on either side. Okay, we've already talked about amides, right? Look at this, there's an alpha proton on the alpha carbon. No question, that's where we're going to deprotonate with LDA. There's no other position on that molecule that would be touched. There's no other proton that would be touched by any of the bases that, that we'll talk about in this class. Okay, here we're back over on this other side. We're looking again at a, at a situation where there's CHs on both sides, but the CH on the less hindered side is where LDA will deprotonate. LDA will deprotonate on the less hindered side. That other side has an extra alkyl group. LDA is, is very choosy. Okay, when you get down to situations like this, I hope you're always looking for alpha carbons. Right, look over here, there's alpha protons on, on this alpha position, but wait a second. Look at that carboxylic acid. You're not gonna be doing anything with LDA as long as this carboxylic acid is there. That carboxylic acid is you know, somewhere on the order of 20 orders of magnitude more acidic than the alpha protons. So the first thing that LDA is gonna do is it's gonna deprotonate the less acidic position, right? It, it doesn't matter that OH is less hindered it's less acidic, so it's LDA will deprotonate there. If you want to deprotonate on this other side over here, if you wanted to make an enolate, you've got to convert that to an ester. Then you can make an enolate. 
And you can always cleave the ester and convert it back into a carboxylic acid, but you're not gonna be making any enolates when there's a carboxylic acid anywhere in, in your reaction mixture and especially on the same molecule. Over here, once again, we've, we've got alpha protons on both sides. See how great those are? Boy, right? <clears throat> but if you wanted to make any kind of an enolate over here, especially on this less hindered side, you can't do that when there's an OH present because this OH is going to deprotonate. If you want to do something with that OH, you've got to protect it and get rid of the OH. And the way we do that is we make silyl ethers. That's how we do it in modern organic chemistry. So if you want to make enolates, convert it to the silyl, the alcohols into silyl ethers, terp-butyl dimethyl silyl ethers. In some cases, we use trimethyl silyl. They fall off a little bit too easily for, for most chemists. Right? If you want to make an enolate out of a carboxylic acid, convert that into an ester first. You know how to do that. Fischer esterification or make the acyl chloride, but you can't deprotonate and make enolates in the presence of uh, uh, you know, these regular enolates in the presence of these acidic functional groups. Now, we didn't talk about this, but <clears throat> am amides, like carboxamides, are acidic. They're almost as acidic as water. And we haven't really discussed the chemistry of deprotonating amides, but they have about the same acidity as water. Uh, not quite as acidic, but close. I'll just write here, about as acidic as water. Not quite, but certainly, if you put LDA in there, the LDA is just gonna grab the H off the amide nitrogen. You're not gonna be making any enolates. And unfortunately, we don't have a simple solution that we will teach you in this class. We have solutions, but we're just not gonna take the time to teach you in this class. We're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna teach you how to temporarily protect that group. You could certainly, you know, we're not, we're not generally talking about this. If you wanted, you could, uh, use base to deprotonate, sodium hydride is something we would use, and then alkylate it, and then you can start doing enolate chemistry once, once you've gotten rid of that proton, but we're not gonna teach you any way to get rid of that methyl group, because once it's there, it's there. You better like having that there. So uh, we don't have a simple solution for temporary protection that we teach you in a sophomore organic chemistry course. Okay, and then last, like, are there situations where, where bases whether it's T-butoxide or LDA will deprotonate the more hindered side? The answer is yes. So remember I told you that back in, in the 1960s and the 1950s, everybody used these 1,2-dicarbonyl compounds where there were two carbonyl groups on, on your substrate. And any kind of an alkoxide base could efficiently deprotonate here between the two carbonyls, even though it's more hindered. And LDA would also deprotonate at that more acidic site. Right, this isn't a case where you have equal acidity. This position right here has, is vastly more acidic um, than this other side, something like 10 orders of magnitude more acidic. So the only place that you eat, right, LDA will go after the most acidic site. LDA is only choosy for regiochemistry uh, based on sterics. So, <clears throat> and this is, this is an acidity difference here. It's not a case where these are equally acidic on both sides. So it's not like you would never deprotonate here uh, because these two sides are not equally acidic. Okay, so again, um, I've had people ask me, it's like, boy, if you want to deprotonate this, can't you use LDA for that to deprotonate the red hydrogen? You could, but you, you know, you got to make LDA. You got to spend your whole morning making LDA. Right? And whereas potassium T-butoxide, you could scoop out of a can, use it by the shovel full if you wanted. So we, we wouldn't typically use LDA to deprotonate here, even though it would. Um, that would just be a waste of your morning. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of effort to, to, to do that. All right. <clears throat> Boy, this is, let's go ahead and talk about um, stereochemistry again and regiochemistry in some way. So I want to just remind you that when you deprotonate uh, to make an enolate, that enolates are planar. I'm going to draw out, right? If I draw the, the um, if I draw out what's what's happening here uh, using arrow pushing, there's two different types of resonance structures we draw for enolates. But I'm going to draw the planar resonance structure for the enolate, just so we can get the idea that the enolate is planar, that pi system is planar. Do you remember which carbon is, is nucleophilic? It's this carbon right here that's nucleophilic. So if you add an electrophile like methyl iodide, the methyl group can add from the top or the bottom face. Now, 
the examples I've given you, you get a mixture of enantiomers. But in this case, there's another stereogenic center on the other side of this molecule. And the LDA doesn't change that stereogenic center, right? You can assign that to, that's got the R configuration. I'm very fast at assigning those configurations. And LDA is not going to change that to the S configuration. No matter what you do on that other side, using LDA and, and making enolates here, no matter what you're doing here, this is still going to have the R configuration. So <clears throat> let me go ahead and draw out the product, plural products, that you get when you treat this with LDA. So when I do this alkylation reaction here of my enolate, those aren't well-drawn arrows, um, of that enolate, I'm going to get half of the molecules the methyl group will add from the bottom face. There's my new methyl group. I'm just going to draw a wedge here for the first one. And then the other half of the molecules, that new CH3 group, will add from the top face. And these are not enantiomers of each other. Right? If it was truly a mirror image, then both of the stereogenic centers would have been inverted here. In fact, the, um, and so what's the relationship for these? You can't just write, you can't for this product just draw this and write plus E because this other product is not the mirror image. It's what we call a diastereomer. It's a stereochemical isomer that is not the mirror image of the first one. So in the case of diastereomers, you have to draw the diastereomer. You're not allowed to just write plus E. You can't write plus D because there's, a, 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 there's another isomer you could have formed. There's also the mirror image, which is another stereoisomer. So <clears throat> you have to draw diastereomers. So just remember that if you're making diastereomers. You have to draw it. So watch out for stereochemistry. And you might think, boy, that sucks, this stereochemistry thing. I don't want to use enolates. That's not right. <laughs> Synthetic organic chemists love diastereomer issues because we spend all our time trying to think of how do we make one diastereomer and not the other? How do we end up so we don't end up with a mixture of two diastereomers? Can we design selective reactions that give us one and only one of these diastereomers? And we have ways to do that. And that's why we can design drugs with 15, diastere with 15 stereogenic centers and control every single one of them. Well, mostly. <laughs> Okay, so, <clears throat> so you got to watch out for stereochemistry for, and the presence of stereoisomers always in this class, in my class, when you answer my questions on the exams. Okay, <clears throat> let me take you back in time. Well, what was it like in the 1950s? Maybe that was a pretty cool era. Um, I don't know, baby boomers and hot rods and rock and roll and whatever they were doing in the 1950s. Uh, here's what they were doing in the 1950s. They didn't have LDA. What they had was this trick they used to, to put two carbonyl groups on their substrate, and then they could use the same old alkoxide bases that they were using for Williamson ether synthesis. So back in the 1950s, uh, we used 1,3-dicarbonyls, where we had two esters, or we had two ketones, or we had one ketone and one ester, or we had two amides. Every variation you can imagine, this is the way they did it. And in this case, sodium ethoxide is more than powerful enough to deprotonate these CHs. These CHs right here on this, on this, uh, this is called diethylmalonate. The, the diacid is called malonic acid. That's more acidic than water. So more acidic than water. I told you you have to memorize these pKa's. And so now we can get away with this sodium ethoxide to make an enolate out of that. Let me go ahead and draw the enolate. I'll draw the carbanion form of the enolate just because it reminds us of which position is nucleophilic. So if I remove one of the protons, I'll have that en Wow, that looks like a, a sad face. Let me make it a little, here we go. It looks a little more smiley face there. That's a minus charge, sorry. I'm kind of goofing around here. But it still looks like a smiley face. Whatever. So you make an enolate. That's a stable. We call that a stabilized enolate because there's carbonyls on both sides. Um, and it is not as nucleophilic as an enolate that was made from just one carbonyl with LDA. But it's still more than nucleophilic enough for us to do SN2 chemistry. More than nucleophilic enough. So if we add methyl iodide to this, 
right? That's a powerful way to make carbon-carbon bonds. This is the way they did it um, half a century ago. And you could still do this today. But, you know, the problem is I almost never want to have two carbonyl groups on my molecule. Why start with something I don't want, which is two carbonyl groups, when I only want one carbonyl group? And so they had a trick that they used back in the 1950s and 1940s and way back then. The trick they used was that if they hydrolyzed the esters using hydrochloric acid and water and heat, that's the recipe I gave you for one of the two recipes I gave you, but this is the recipe you use. If you use these conditions right here, acidic hydrolysis, it's, kind of, it's the opposite of a Fischer sterification, what you'll notice is one of the two carboxylic acid groups disappeared. Under the conditions of this reaction, the other carboxylic acid group cleaves off and turns into carbon dioxide. And anybody can purify away carbon dioxide. It bubbles out as the gas. Right? You'd have to go through great lengths to trap that if you wanted to keep it. So that's a powerful transformation. So way back when, people started with two carbon eels when they made enolates. They used these crummy bases, because that's all they had. And then they made CC bonds, carbon-carbon bonds, with that chemistry. And then they removed the extra carbonyl during the hydrolysis step. So what if you wanted the ethyl ester? Well, too bad. You've got, if you want to get rid of this carbonyl group, you've got to hydrolyze it to the, to the two carboxylic acids, and one of them will pop off under the conditions of the reaction while you are heating with acid. So you have to watch out for this functional group combination. Anytime you have a carbonyl group over here on the bottom, and that's an amide, that's a ketone, that's an ester, that's a carbox well, carboxylic acid, these conditions for hydrolysis that I showed you will remove the, the CO2H. So you need to look out for this functional group because it doesn't matter whether I started with diethylmalonate any time at all that you have this functional group pattern. A carboxylic acid um, that, that's um, positioned, uh, we call this a, a beta keto acid. So, uh, in other words, this is the acid part right here. And this is the alpha position, and this is the beta position, and this is the keto group. So, whenever you see a beta keto acid, you should be thinking, hey, I can pop off that acid group if I don't want that extra carbon there. So, these conditions that I'm showing you uh, here would hydrolyze any ester if you had an ester in there. But even if you don't have an ester, there's a reaction that happens. Let me show you how you remove. I'm going to spin around this carboxylic acid group so you can see um, the, the conformation of this molecule that reacts. I'm really redrawing the same molecule so we can do the arrow pushing here. So there's this transformation that happens under these acidic conditions. And so this is just a, a, a conformational intermediate. And let me go ahead and draw out the arrow pushing. And the arrow pushing looks like this. I'm going to pick up that proton and put it on the carbonyl. I'm going to start the arrow pushing with the pi bond. And then I'm going to take this HO electrons and I'll push them into the down here. And then I'm going to break this CC bond and push it over to there. The arrow pushing should remind you of the Diels-Alder reaction. This works and is facile because it shares um, a property. It is a pericyclic reaction like the Diels-Alder reaction. That's why this is facile. And so this, if you're looking at the arrow pushing, you can see that this is going to lose. You're going to make a double bond here, and we're going to lose the elements of carbon dioxide in that reaction. And so the intermediate that you get is not the ketone. It is the enol. That's the intermediate that you get out of this reaction. And I hope you remember, you can't isolate enols. They're not stable, right? The, whoops, um, there's nothing you can do to stop this from happening, but the enol form is going to very rapidly tautomerize into the keto form, whether you want it to or not. So this decarboxylation removes um, an extra carbonyl group that's, that you probably didn't want to have on there <clears throat> at any point in time. <clears throat> OK. we. Uh, um, we refer to this, this way of, of doing SN2 reactions, this way, this, this kind of archaic way of taking one three dicarbonyl compounds and making stabilized enolates like this and then doing SN2 reactions. Because this 
the, dicarbo the dicarboxylic acid that this is the ethyl ester of is called, that's called malonic acid and th that's diethyl malonate, it's a malonic ester. So we call this the malonic ester synthesis. This is the way people used to synthesize all different kinds of carboxylic acids making this CC bond that, that I just put in red there. And then you blow off that extra, um, that extra carboxylic acid group that you didn't want by, by hydrolyzing things. So this is this kind of sequence of events looks kind of clunky, uh, but that's the way people used to do that. Now, obviously, or I don't know if it's obvious, you don't have to have a carboxylic acid on both sides. You could start uh, with a beta keto ester. So here's the ester group right here. And you can see there's a keto group at the beta position. And this is acidic. It's acidic right here at, at this position. You can use those old-fashioned bases like sodium ethoxide and sodium methoxide. I'm going to be very careful to make sure that these, that, that my ester here and my base match. Because if I use sodium ethoxide, I would start to see attack on that ester of the ethoxy group, and I would do I would start to exchange the methyl esters for ethyl esters and end up with a big mixture mess. That would be horrible. But we can deprotonate using an alkoxide base, sodium ethoxide in this case, and then do an SN2 reaction. And that would be a way, right, to, to add a new carbon-carbon bond. If I had an ethyl group, right, I could have added that ethyl group using this, this same type of sequence. And now I already told you how to get rid of, of this group right here. I, I, we can use those same conditions to get rid of this, the, this, this ester group here that we don't want. We use HCl, we use acidic hydrolysis, H2O, and heat. And that gets rid of that ester, and we usually don't write the CO2 byproduct because you, you know, you'd have to work hard to trap that CO2. Nobody wants that. I guess we just let it go in the atmosphere and contribute to global warming or something. So. Um, notice what this does. This transformation puts an alkyl group at the more hindered position of a ketone. And that is something that we can't do with LDA. Let me just remind you what would happen if you used LDA. LDA cannot deprotonate here. It, it doesn't de if we take the case down below and you start with this simple ketone, unfortunately, as you know, LDA goes for the less hindered position. And so the enolate you would get is the enolate that's on the less substituted side. And so if you did LDA, you wouldn't get the product up, up on the top. You would get this product over here. And there's nothing you can do to fix that with LDA. You're not gonna, we're not going to teach you how to make, selectively make enolates of just simple ketones um, on the more hindered side. We're only teaching you to use LDA to make carbon-carbon bonds on the less hindered side. So, so there is some, some argument for why you might want to use this acetoacetic ester synthesis uh, on top. Um, it's not that common. We have ways around that in modern organic synthesis. Uh, <clears throat> and really, the main reason that we'll teach you this, if, you, if you've taken biochemistry, bio 98 here at UC High, this is the basis for lipid biosynthesis. Lipid biosynthesis is based on the acetoacetic ester and malonic acid this synthesis. Enzymes in your body are decarboxylating, uh, making malonate anions, making carbon-carbon bonds, uh, and then decarboxylating, all enzymatic. All right, so enolates. We are, we are done with chapter 21. Get ready for more enolate chemistry in chapter 22.